Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. My name is Stacy Stubblefield, and I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Telesign, based in Los Angeles with a big office here in Belgrade. And I'm going to tell you my story of starting a company, growing it from three to 300 people, and then selling it. So let's get started. Introduction. OK, so who am I? I'm one of the co-founders of Telesign. This is actually a picture from earlier this year. We had our sales kickoff here in Telesign. I'm the one in the middle. Um, and then the two guys around me are uh, the two other co-founders. We started the company 13 and a half years ago, back in 2005. Um, and we all have very different skills. I'm more on the product and technical side. Uh, the guy on the left, Ryan, is more operational, and the guy on the right, Darren, is very much a salesman. And so the three of us work very well together. What does Telesign do? So we do the phone verification that you guys have probably experienced on a bunch of websites. So how many people here have gotten a text message with a one-time passcode that you had to enter in online? Can you raise your hands? Yeah, so <laughs> that's most of you in here. So when we started in 2005, that was not a common practice at all. Actually, one of the major objections that we used to get to people using our product was, what if somebody doesn't have a phone available? Which, as you guys can imagine, is not really an objection that we hear very often anymore. Um, but that is what Telesign does. We send those one-time passcodes via text message, via voice call, and then we also provide a lot of data intelligence around the phone number that you're providing into the web service. We now do over $100 million in revenue every year, more than 8 billion transactions all over the globe. We work with 21 of the top 25 global web properties, have about 300 employees worldwide, and we were actually acquired last October. So it's been just under a year since the company was sold. But as you might imagine, that is not how it all started. So let's start at the beginning. The early years. <laughs> So Telesign was actually born in an incubator. So in 2005, again, incubators were not a common thing. Do people here typically know what an incubator is? Are you guys fairly familiar with the concept? So it's a group of people coming together with shared resources uh, to start companies. And so, I mean, that's basically what we were. We were located in an office in Beverly Hills, the tech hub of Beverly Hills, which is a joke. It's not a tech hub at all. Uh, we were in an office with a bunch of other companies that were being started at the same time, and we sh all shared resources. So we had like shared technical resources, we had shared administrative resources, servers, because back then there was no AWS. That was actually the first year that AWS started, but uh, we had our own servers. Um, actually, I'll show you where we had our servers. So this. This is a picture of our very old office in 2005. We were in a building full of attorneys. I would often get asked as I was going up in the elevator to work if I was old enough to work in the building <laughs> because everyone else there was much more professional and um, you know, typically much older. Uh, and people, one thing that I noticed when I was very young is that I would get into these elevators full of people going up to their jobs and they would look so sad on Mondays. They would be sad to be there in the morning and I would be so excited because I was so happy to be going up to this company that we were starting. It was a very exciting time. And so that's when I really knew that this is the type of thing that I wanted to do, start a company and get it going. And this, actually, just to the left of that guy was our kitchen, and that's where we kept all of our servers. So we, <laughs> we had servers next to our sink, next to our refrigerator. That's just how you do startups, you know? You just have to make it work. And so we would refer to our kitchen affectionately as our server room. <laughs> so I'm gonna go through exactly what we had at the beginning. Very little is actually the answer to that. Our product was very bad. We had only one product at the time, and it was sending those passcodes that you now get via text message. 
it was sending that via voice. So we would send a call and it would say something like, your code is 123. People would enter that code in. Uh, but it barely worked. We built it as fast as we possibly could. We actually routed calls since we didn't know what we were doing at the time. We started our call off in the US, sent it to a carrier that was overseas that one of our uh, funders had a business relationship with, and they would actually send the call then back to the US, which is very expensive. We lost money on every call <laughs> at the time. And then sometimes, actually, the system completely went down. So it would stop working entirely. And so I would just sit there and wait for a new call request to roll in. And then I would make the call myself and pretend to be a robot. So I would be like, hey, you know, your code is one, two, three. Once again, your code is one, two, three, and then hang up. Because we had to make it work, you know? You have to do what you have to do in order to start a company. The point of this whole thing was just to test the market. We just wanted to know if anyone was going to use this service at all. It was questionable back then because it was not something that people used on a regular basis. So we didn't know what we were doing. That's going to be the theme here in the early years. And I'll go on to the next part of us not knowing what we were doing. Our sales were very bad. <laughs> We, again, we had no idea what we were doing, so we would just spam people. We would get a list of email addresses and send those email addresses information about our product. Sometimes we would just harvest those email addresses. I would literally go to Google and do like star at Microsoft.com and just pull a list of email addresses and send information about our product to those email addresses. And over time, it started to work, but this is definitely not a recommended path for, for how to market and to do sales. We had no tools like Salesforce. We would just write down things. So if I talked to someone who was interested, I would just take it on a notepad. We ha had no idea how to explain what we were doing. Since it, was, since it was such a new technology at the time, we would try to explain it to people how we thought they would understand it, but it was very difficult. Um, and then our, you can actually, this is one of our old um, booths at a, at a conference. As you can see, it's not professional. We did it in-house. Um, we would set it up ourselves, uh, which again, not recommended. People get angry with you at these conferences if you try to set up your own booth, but that's what we did back in the day because we had no choice. And then finally, our processes were bad. So we didn't have good processes. We would build transactions by hand. We would go through every, at the end of every month, look at all of the transactions that had gone through. And just to give you guys a sense of this, we have a different price for every country where a call or a text message is sent. So we would have to go through and see like how many texts were sent to you know, Saudi Arabia this month, how many were sent to the US, how many were sent to Germany, and then we would hand bill. Not, not a good way to do things, but we were just making it work. Our costs were not well documented. They were all mixed up with the, the rest of the cost in the incubator. We had no development cycles. Anytime that we wanted to make a change to the product, we would just go talk to our one dev and ask him to do a change, and it would immediately go live, <laughs> which is a very fast way of doing things, but also a very dangerous way of doing things. So the point of this whole part of the presentation is that we had no idea what we were doing at the time, but you don't really need to know. The point of this part of starting a business is just to make sure that you have something that people want, and that's it. You don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to you know, have millions of dollars in sales. You just have to prove that there's a market demand out there, and then continue. So, gaining traction. At some point, we started to get some clients, believe it or not. And we became really good at understanding our product through our clients' eyes. Like, why did they like the product? What problems were they looking to solve? Uh, how can we explain it to them in such a way that they'll understand? That was one of our main breakthroughs, actually. We also had a system that mostly worked eventually, and we also then had clients that we could reference. So if somebody came to us and asked us, what, who are your clients? It makes a lot of difference if you can say the name of some big company versus, you know, we have no clients. It became much easier to sell at the time. But this is when our challenges really started. So challenge number one, that we faced, and of course this is different for every company, but you'll all face challenges if you're trying to start a company. Our first challenge was VoIP numbers. So 
A lot of our clients use our product to stop people from creating thousands or millions of fake accounts and doing fraud with those accounts. And we had a very early client who used us in that way. So it was an e-commerce client. In order to check out, you had to create an account and then go through phone verification. And at the beginning, this actually stopped fraudsters. This e-commerce client had a very uh, pesky fraudster who was constantly trying to defraud them. And once they installed phone verification, the fraudster went away. But he came back shortly afterwards found a way to get through phone verification with some fake numbers, which I'll get into in a second, sent our client an email and basically said, I'm never going to leave you alone. It doesn't matter what you put in place. I'm always going to find a way to defraud you, which our, cl our client then forwarded to us. And that was a huge threat to our business. We knew that if we didn't find a way to solve that problem, that we were going to go out of business. So we had to find a solution. And long story short, we figured out how to identify VoIP numbers, which I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but temporary anonymous numbers that you can get online. If we didn't find a way to identify those, our business was dead. But we did, and this is actually one of our most popular products today called Phone ID, again, doing millions or billions of transactions every year. Challenge number two, text messages. So like I said, when we first started, we did one-time passcodes via voice only. And one of our clients came to us and said, hey, can you send text messages for us instead? And being naive as we were, we said, of course, this will be super simple. We can send text messages, no problem. <laughs> We quickly learned that text messaging is a world unto itself. You guys probably find it very simple to open up your phone, you send a text message, your friend gets it, like, no big deal. There is a lot of complication behind the scenes. The fact that a text message ever arrives on your phone is basically a miracle, if you knew how it worked. And we got to understand that very quickly as we tried to scale out the, this part of the business. It was a huge challenge, but solving that challenge and figuring out, figuring out how to do it well became one of our biggest selling points over time, the fact that we could do this with high quality. Uh, so ev with every challenge uh, comes an opportunity to vastly improve your product. And then finally, challenge number three, too much usage. I know that sounds silly. like. Oh no, you guys had too much usage. It actually was a big problem for us because we had a very big company as a client, but they were doing very, very low number of transactions. And we never expected them to do many transactions at all. Neither did they. They didn't expect to do many transactions. So they didn't negotiate any of their rates. They hadn't warned us and said, hey, we might start sending millions of transactions. And then all of a sudden one day, their transaction volumes just spiked up with no warning. And so we had one vendor, one text message vendor at the time, and that text message vendor just completely fell over. Um, so we couldn't handle the traffic. We had to figure out how to, we had to figure out the whole world of text messaging, ba basically pull in more vendors, figure out how to fail over during outages and whatnot. So that, that was a big challenge that we had. And then we also had pricing. This, this company had not negotiated their pricing. They ran up a bill worth many millions of dollars within a 30-day period. And we didn't know what to do because we were the small company and we were like 23, 24 years old. Do you send this company a huge bill for millions of dollars? Do you discount their pricing? Do you call them up and try to, you know, like uh, do a negotiation in the middle of them sending all these transactions? We really didn't know what to do. I'm curious, out of this room, how many people would have just sent them the bill even if it was $5 million bill. Yeah. I mean, that's basically what we did, too. <laughs> and, of course, the next day we got a phone call <laughs> uh, where they had a lot of questions, and we eventually came to terms, but l they were not happy about that large bill. Um, but they still remained a client. We made it through. We did a negotiation. We learned how to work with big companies. All of this is just a learning process. And that's really, again, the point of this part of the presentation and the whole point of this middle sort of area of starting a company is that it's never a smooth ride. You'll have a lot of questions like this. These are all very specific to our company, but 
Uh, there's always questions that don't have easy answers, and what we really found is that for every big question that comes up and big challenge that you have to solve, it ends up making your business and your product so much better. It's actually, it's worth having to go through all of that work. And so, I always really liked this, uh, this graphic. It's called the iceberg illusion, um, and I think that it's very appropriate. And basically, the point of it is that there's a lot that goes into success. People just see that you know you've started a company, and then all of a sudden it's worth you know however however many millions of dollars, and then you sell it. But in reality, there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot of hard work that people don't see, a lot of dedication, a lot of failure, a lot of sacrifice, um, and it's really hard to show those things, but. Uh, but it's true, and it's something that everyone goes through. And then finally, growing up. So, at this point, we have finally landed some major clients. We've actually hit a million dollars in run rate revenue. So that means uh, that we basically that means that we hit two thousand seven hundred and forty dollars a day. We knew that number, and we were waiting to hit it. We were super excited. This is actually us at a conference. That is when we first, that moment is when we actually hit $2,740 in one day. We were so excited that we took a picture. We actually took several pictures. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a moment that we still remember. And then we actually quickly reached 10 million in yearly revenue with only 12 employees. So that was pretty, pretty good. And, but at the same time, we knew as three very young co-founders that we didn't know all of the answers and that the next part of the process of growing the company was going to be to scale beyond what we had any kind of experience doing. So we ended up bringing in a professional CEO. He organized our company quite a bit added a lot of process to the company, um, which was good in many ways. The technology became really, really stable. Our sales team was a machine, could get us into any client. And we finally took a round A of funding and ended up purchasing a company here in Serbia with that round A, which is why we have a big office here. However, as usual, there were still challenges. So one of the biggest challenges was maintaining our culture. When you're a small company and you can just, everyone's basically in the same room or same very small office together, it's really easy to maintain your culture. You can see what everyone's doing, you can have a large influence on what people are doing and thinking about, very simple. But as you grow and you have bigger offices and you have offices all over the world, it's hard to know, like, how are people feeling about your company? Uh, how are they interacting with clients? You just have to, you have to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And so what we did for as long as we could was interview any new hires. It, it's a lot of work, but it's definitely worth it to make sure that the people coming into the company fit your culture, especially key new hires, managers. Um, we also built a good onboarding and training process, and we had a lot of company events so we could keep everyone on the same page. But again, this is a really one of the most difficult parts of growing a company as you scale out. Second thing, maintaining quality. Really, really hard. Again, when you're in a small office together, it's really easy to know what people are doing and make sure that they're thinking about everything the right way. But it becomes more difficult as you grow. And so we had to make sure the most important thing that I found was making sure that people understand why they're doing something. It's not just about sending a text message, and if it doesn't get there, no big deal. It's, there's actually a person waiting for this text message so that they can enter their account or so that they can create a new account. So it's, it's something that is very important to keep in mind whenever you're growing a company and training new people is making sure they understand what is the point behind your business? Why are they doing what they need to do? And then also building out KPIs, uh, key performance indicators, to make sure that people are aligned and working together uh, to hit your goals. And then finally, giving up control. <laughs> This is actually probably the most difficult one for me because I like being involved in everything in the company and knowing exactly what's going on all the time. 
but it's just not possible with 300 people. So, uh, so in the early days, if I wanted to know something, I would just yell across the room, like, hey, what's going on with this account? Hey, why did you do this or that? But you, again, you can't do it as you grow up. So you have to learn to trust people. You have to learn to make sure that you're hiring the right people that can get the job done and just let them do what they need to do. Um, so that really, learning that allowed the company to grow a lot faster. The point of all this is that people believe that once you grow to a certain point, the challenges really diminish, but it's not the case. The challenges just change. They become t challenges of scale and they become challenges of a distributed workforce and those types of challenges. They're just different, but they're no less challenging uh, and they're no less critical. So something to keep in mind for all of you guys who are growing your business out there. It doesn't ever really get easier. <laughs> And then finally, selling the company. Seems like this would be a really good day. And I mean, it definitely is a good day, but it's really more difficult than I expected to let go of a company. It's almost like a child, I would imagine, because you've been working on this company for so many years. The people that you work with have become like family to you. You're used to seeing them every day and working with them. And you've also become an expert in your business, so you're kind of used to people coming to you for answers. And you know that when you sell this company, you're eventually you're going to have to give that all up. So we had to make sure that this is really what was best for the company, and this is what we wanted to do. Not, not as easy of a question as you would think it would be. So if you're going to sell your company, you have to make sure you vet your buyer. I have heard so many horror stories of people selling a company and the buyer basically tears it apart immediately. So buyer comes in, you know, dismantles the company for the most part, maybe keeps a few key hires and that's basically it. It's really important to make sure you know why the company wants to buy you and what they plan to do with your company once they buy you. So. These are the types of questions that we asked. How much autonomy would we have? Would people get to stay? Uh, why did this company want to buy us, et cetera? So the last thing we wanted was to see our company get torn apart. And then surviving the purchase process, it took an entire year from the day that we had a company telling us that they wanted to buy us until the day the transaction closed, a year. That's a long time to be going through a purchase process. It's hard to describe the amount of work that goes into the due diligence behind someone who's trying to buy a company, but they're asking so many little questions about every little thing, and you have your entire executive team focused on that, which takes a lot away from the business. So it's really important to make sure that you have a way to allow people to continue to focus on their day jobs while getting the due diligence done. Really, really hard and a very stressful time. But our happy ending was the company was finally purchased October 31st, 2017. It's been a year. I am still at the company watching this entire process take place. It's very educational to see a company come in and determine how to best use the assets of your company. Our, our buyer has been really supportive of us. They've just brought in a lot of expertise. They've brought in a lot of access that we didn't have before. Uh, they've been really great, and from what I can see, this is a pretty rare outcome, but we've been very happy with it. Um, hopefully everybody else in the company feels the same way. And then I just wanted to end on this. This is a painting that I have hanging in my house for inspiration. Um, I look at it every day, and I think it's very... Uh, apropos for anyone who's starting a company. And it's two little birds, and one of them is saying, what if I fall? And the other is saying, what if you fly? Which is, I mean, really appropriate to starting a company. There's a really good chance that you'll go beyond what you could ever have achieved before. So exciting, very exciting time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. still have like a minute or two if anyone has any questions. No? Nope. Good? All right. Yeah. Why did we sell the company? 
We thought that it was good timing. So this company that came to buy us was a company that had the type of access that we'd been looking for into carriers for the last two years or so. Um, it's a, kind of a long story with our industry, but getting access directly to carriers around the world was something that we were looking to do. And we had only managed in like a couple of years to get direct connections to like 60 carriers. They had direct connections to like 650. And so we thought that they would really accelerate our roadmap, and they did. So it's great. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I think that eventually, definitely, I will. It's really fun to start a new business. There's nothing better than going to work every day, having this challenge that you are solving with a, a core group of people. So eventually, that'll definitely happen. Hello. Yeah. Uh, hello, Stacey. Uh, question. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you uh, said that uh, there uh, needs to be a market cap uh, for your product in order to work. Yeah. But if you have a bad product, then yeah. people will not use it. So. Well, you'd you be know. surprised. <laughs> if you and, and I am surprised. So that that's the question. <laughs> so uh, you it... you had uh, on the glassy legs your product. So it was barely uh, working, and you prove a point to your investors. Yeah. Is that the case? That's basically it. So there's, I guess there's really two different ways to start a company. You can be a, a, a challenger, so there could already be a technology out there that you're essentially copying, which is a really, I mean, a very legitimate way to start a business. Or you can be doing something brand new. So if you're a challenger, sure, you don't really have to prove the product out. You can just build and do it well, right? On the other hand, if you have a brand new technology, which this was at the time, nobody else was doing this, then you have to prove that people are actually gonna use whatever you've created. And so that's why we could get away with the product not being great, just because it was something brand new and we were proving that people actually wanted that type of thing. And then after that, we made it good. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Okay, so for more questions, please find Stacey at TeleSign, I guess she will be there, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.